is the Real Health Podcast brought to you by Reardon Clinic. Our mission is to bring you the latest information and top experts in functional and integrative medicine to help you make informed decisions on your path to real health. All right. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Real Health Podcast. I'm Dr. Lucas Timms, and I'm joined today by uh, the newest addition to the Reardon Clinic team, Dr. Kirsten West. Dr. West, thanks for being with us today. Great to be here. <laughs> Dr. West is um, a new, uh, like I said, a new addition to our team, comes uh, with a, a, a great track record of working in the integrative oncology space, uh, has seen a lot of stuff in, in, her, uh, in her career so far, and just brings a wealth of knowledge and is really uh, a nice addition. So we're excited to have her. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit, Dr. West, about cancer, of course, but more so specifically underlying causes of cancer, which I think this is where, um, you know, there, there seems to be a lot of lacking discussion, I think, on the more conventional side. And I think it's an area where integrative oncology actually is taking more of a lead in terms of dealing with what, what people may term as root causes of cancer. Um, so the way I explain it to my patients is that, you know, cancer is never just bad luck, right? Despite what they may be told by their traditional oncologist or, or anybody else that they've talked to so far, and that there's always sort of factors and layers of things that build up sometimes over years that ultimately create this crescendo process, which is, which is a tumor or a cancer. Is that, is that kind of how you see it? Yeah, yeah, I absolutely see it like that. And, you know, doing this for, gosh, both you and I have been doing this for over a decade now, which is crazy to think about. But I think that cancer really comes down to genes that are mismatched with our current lifestyle mm. and environment. So, right. you know, I think some of the biggest things that I see in practice, and I'd love to, I'd love to hear your thoughts on these too, but I think stress is a big one. And we know that stress impacts the immune system. I think metabolic imbalance, I mean, you can really start to think about the terrain 10, but I think that we can pull if for people who aren't familiar with the terrain 10, it's Dr. Winter's work. And I know you and Dr. Ron have done several podcasts on that, but we right. can pull from those and kind of see some main patterns that we see more clinically, or maybe that are a little bit more relevant. So, yeah, yeah. I think the terrain 10 is, is a great kind of, um, um, uh, all encompassing way of, of teasing out all these different factors. Um, and, but I think what you said was really uh, poignant, which was that we're, we have these mismatched genes with the lives that we're trying to live right now. And, I, and um, I've heard some other people say different versions of that, but it really does ring true because, you know, I think a lot of people get kind of drawn into that mindset of, cancer being a genetic problem purely, right. Right? right? But it doesn't really just start and end with the genes, essentially, right? right? We lose, we, I, I feel like if we, if we speak to it like that, that, you know, it's just luck of the draw. Right. We lose the empowerment to actually be responsible and take charge of our health and make changes. And I think that that's what you and I see in practice is that when people really do start to see what areas they need to be focused on that could have led to having cancer, that's when we see healing. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So if we take sort of that, I don't know, sometimes I almost see it in my head as like a pyramid where it's like that top portion of the pyramid is, is the cancer and, and maybe right underneath that is a layer of this genetic dysfunction. Right. But then there's several right. more layers beneath that, that, that are holding those issues up. Right. And so those are the layers we're talking about. Right. Right. And it's just, it's just like, and I, this was so poignant. And I heard someone say this, but there's so many, there's several people walking around with BRCA mutations that will never know that they have BRCA mutations because right. they never have cancer. And so it's just, that's, that's an example of a gene that hasn't been turned on based on specific modifiable, modifiable lifestyle factors. So, right, right. And you're talking about the breast cancer, you know, right. gene, which most cancer people know gene. as the BRCA gene or, you know, B BRCA1 or 2. Yeah. Uh, and what most people don't understand is that actually this gene, we want it turned on. It yeah. actually prevents that like cascade uh, of, of the cancer process. It's when it's mutated and turned off right. is when we have that increased risk. But um, and that's a that's a great segue into, you know, 
talk a little bit about how do these genes actually get turned on and off? Yeah. So I, you know, I kind of think of it as we have this, we have our blueprint of our genes, right? Mm -hmm. That have been given to us by our parents, but then we have the contractors and the contractors are the ones that actually put the blueprint into motion or don't put the blueprint into motion. And the contractors are those modifiable lifestyle factors, such as stress, immune function, dietary intake, toxic burden, Mm -hmm. inflammation, all of these things that can lead to a diagnosis of cancer or cause turning on or off of these genes that could lead to a carcinogenic Mm -hmm. process. Right. And, and this is not a black and white process either. It's a, it's a always evolving dynamic process that's going on in our bodies every second of every day. Right. Which is why our treatments are never just black and white, which is why we never just focus on one thing or another thing. It's really about finding those things that come together to create the greatest harmony in the body so that the body gets back in the driver's seat from a disease or cancering process or things like that. So exactly. Right. So it's helpful to know about the cancer and what type it is and if there's driver mutations and what genes are involved, because then that can help you to maybe reverse engineer the underlying issues as well. So we're not discounting that all that information they use on the traditional side isn't helpful. It's just that there's more that we can do to actually influence that top of the pyramid right? Right. by, and, and by modifying the environment, right? Exactly, exactly. Because there's some genes that are turned on within specific tumors that may relate to a little bit more blood sugar dysregulation. And so if we see that, then we know that, gosh, maybe for years, there's been some metabolic imbalance going on. And that's that's a big area that we need to focus on. Yeah. So, oh, and so, that, sorry, sorry, Dr. Yeah. Tim. Also, that study with ovarian cancer, where they found out that several ovarian cancer um, cells had beta adrenergic receptors on them, which are stimulated mm. by s- stress. By stress. So right. that also plays into it. So yeah. So. But yeah. you've t- you've mentioned diet. You've mentioned stress. You've mentioned um, environmental toxins. That's another big one that I see in a lot of my patients. Do you do you typically test all of your patients for environmental toxins, or just if you get kind of some clues in their history? I do. I do. Obviously, history really helps. You know, to ask them where they grew up, where they're living, et cetera, and figure out. But I do think that if we have the ability to run a toxic profile, toxic panel profile, or Um, Mm -hmm. test on all of our patients. I think that that is something that we should do. The more information, the better. Yeah. Yeah. And another area that gets impacted by all these um, environmental uh, issues and the epigenetics that we're talking about is not just the genes of our cells, but the mitochondria, right? Yeah. Yeah. These mitochondria, which some people are familiar with, some people aren't, but these are little, you know, uh, organelles inside of our cells that come from bacteria actually um, and that you actually get handed down to you by your mom and uh, these are actually the they've sometimes been described as like the energy packs of the cell or the batteries of the cell and um, a lot of the hallmarks of what drives a cancer cell is found in the in with problems in the mitochondria, correct? Right. A lot of people we've actually come to an understanding that cancer may be more of a disease of mitochondria. And so that's an area that we really want to focus on. Right. And that also takes us into fasting because Mm -hmm. we know that fasting is one of the best ways to also help rejuvenate mitochondrial health. So right. Right. Fasting. And so, yeah, now, now shifting more towards um, interventions or therapies that we might uh, employ to address some of these, obviously you can change your diet and and that's a big part of it in terms of, correcting metabolic issues um, or avoiding certain toxins that may be coming in through your food or water. Mm -hmm. Um, As far as uh, ways that we can impact the mitochondria, you talked about fasting, but some of our IV therapies like IV vitamin C and ozone therapy are also mitochondrial therapies, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then there's some great supplements that are good to support mitochondria as well. So that's an area we can really focus on. Yeah. And it's important to understand that, um, you know, everybody's pyramid or the, the, blue, the blueprint is going to be different, right? Yeah. So it's not like, oh, I saw so-and-so 
changed to this type of diet and took these supplements and did this IV therapy, that's what I'm going to do. It's not really that simple, right? It's not, it's not. And that's the beauty of what we do, right? Because it's so individualized and it's so prioritized for each patient. Yeah. So while metabolic patterns may be a huge issue for one person, immune may be a bigger picture for someone, toxic burden may be a larger issue for someone else. So mm-hmm. figuring that out and building the pyramid appropriately, or at least elucidating the period appropriately is the way to go. And that's why I think we're so um, big on, on doing really comprehensive testing with each patient, right? Because we never quite know what each person's blueprint is going to look like. You can't really, um, you know, guess correctly all the time on what those issues are, even with a proper, you know, history and, 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 and figuring out as much as you can about the patient, you still, those labs can really help you to get that, that blueprint, right? Right. And as you spoke about earlier, also the genes, the genes that we might find in specific cancers that they may get through medical and through their medical oncologist or additional. Right. We can put all of that together. So it really is. It's integrative care. It's putting it all together. It's integrative care. And it's it's not just um, something that patients can do while they're uh, going through the cancer treatment process, but even beyond that, right? Because right. this is, again, it's not like you get to this finish line where, okay, the cancer's gone and you don't have to do anything else. No. And that's actually the hardest time because, you know, if patients are in standard care, standard of care treatments and they get finished, that's kind of the time where it's like, well, what do I do now? Right. To make sure that this doesn't come back. And that's where, what we do really helps Because we, I mean, for me, I want my patients to feel so empowered. I know you do too. And I want them to feel better than they ever felt prior to getting cancer. Because there's obviously some reasons or some imbalances that it started in the first place. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I think for some people, when they're first getting started, all of this can be a little overwhelming. Mm -hmm. You think so? I mean, how how do you sort of... um, gently ease people into understanding that there's so much that can be done, but that we have to kind of maybe take things one, one step at a time. Yeah. I think a lot of it comes with getting to know your patient, really meeting them where they are Mm -hmm. or your co-learner, your patient, your co-learner, because we're in this together. Right. Figuring out, you know, are do, can they take a lot of supplements? I mean, supplements aren't always the answer, but getting them on some good base supplements is a great way to start. I think getting labs is a great way to start because if we can get labs, then we can really start to elucidate some patterns that may be at play and we can learn together about the next best steps Mm -hmm. and kind of prioritize a plan because you can't do everything at once. And it is a lot of information and, you know, it is like drinking water from a fire hose. it all at once. So it's good to take it step by step. It, it certainly can be. And sometimes uh, the hardest patients are the ones that come to us and they've, they've already done a lot yeah. of stuff and it hasn't quite maybe been the right stuff for them. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, look, we're still learning everything every day and, and you and I don't claim to know everything about everything. Um, but we do see a lot of patients that come down our come into our offices that have tried a lot of things already that haven't worked. And, and that might be because they're not focusing on the right underlying issues. Right. Right. Exactly. So, so sometimes it's unraveling pulling all back. the stuff that's already been done first. Right. Sometimes it's pulling back and starting. Right. And you know, there is, most people do have kind of an idea of the best way to start, but there's a bunch of stuff that gets loaded on top. And I think it, that can, that's e- so easy to happen when you get on the internet, it's like a wormhole, you know, you Google one thing and then you fall down a rabbit hole and everybody right. thinks that there's this best way or that best way. And really there's the individualized way for the patient. Right. right. Yeah. And that's where, like you said, the labs are important, really getting to know your patients um, and, and giving them kind of that, that game plan, which is always evolving, you know, um, the other, the other point I wanted to touch on with you is that, you know, I think some people, when they start to hear this stuff, they get really excited. And obviously there's, because it's empowering, like you said, but then we sometimes have to manage expectations because if, if a disease process is already pretty advanced, while you still can impact the disease by working on these underlying issues, it doesn't always mean that the disease is going to miraculously go away. No. And, and you also have to think about how many years, you know, seven to, cancer typically starts seven to 10 years before right. 
it being seen on a scan, right? Or it being palpable. And so if it's in the breast um, or somewhere else, but the thing is, is that if it took seven to 10 years to form, we're not going to stop that process. We're not going to halt it. Right. It's going to take time. Yeah. There's no, there's no quick fixes when it comes to cancer. That's for sure. No, it's a journey. It is a journey, but it can be, it can be a very empowering journey and, and a lot of people can reclaim their lives in so many different ways. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think, you know, when it comes down to those, uh, another kind of silver lining that I see to doing this more um, root cause analysis and workup and, and, and addressing those issues is that, uh, and you probably see this with your patients too, is that they end up, uh, that information gets spread amongst their family as well, right? And so even their family members that don't have cancer yet, hopefully, um, they can start to implement some of these things that can be truly more preventative uh, right. in, in their loved ones and their family. Right. And aside from all the individual protocols we may have, there are some very real base things that people could do, like fasting for 13 hours every night, you know, getting right. rid of toxins in your life, eating organic, maybe decreasing some of the some of the starchier or higher sugar laden foods. They're, like those are all things that we could all do, you know, EMF mitigation. Those are, those are all things. Yeah. There's some low hanging fruit for sure. And and some people, you know, kudos to them. They've already kind of started working on those things, but I think, you know, if we're going to truly move the needle with slowing down the, the rise of cancer in in our country, in our world, it's going to be by addressing those low hanging fruit on a massive scale. Right. Yeah. And so that, that that goes to changing our the way we eat, mm-hmm. the way we work, the way we sleep, the way we move. It really is fundamental stuff, but it's hard to it's hard to get everybody bought into that, right? Because we live like going back to what you said originally, we're living lives that don't match, you know, our genes, right? Well, and, and we also, you know, it's human nature to want a quick fix. It really is. Yeah. So yeah. that's part of it too. Instant gratification. Yep. I, wonder, I don't know where that would come from in our society, but yeah. I don't either. I don't either. <laughs> you know, Dr. Tins, I think the other thing that is big that we forget about sometimes is that sense of community. I think mm. that so many of us are on social media now and, you know, a little bit more isolated and we are, we are social animals and we should be together. Yeah. And I know that there's been some studies showing, you know, significantly better outcomes, specifically in ovarian and breast cancer for women who have that community. Yeah. So I think that's a big part too. I do. I think that, yeah, a cancer diagnosis obviously can throw people into a, a, a downward spiral where they may um, disconnect from their community, from their loved ones, um, go into more of an isolation. They might not even tell people that are close to them that they have cancer. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of the opposite of what we really should be doing in terms right. of um, not just the mental, emotional health, but even how our physical bodies work, right? Yep. Yep. So the stress response, it helps with the immune system at all. You know, it really, it all comes together. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And so I think that's, uh, that, that may be a good, a good note to end on there. Uh, I think we've covered uh, a lot of sort of the, those underlying issues that we see talked a little bit about how we would approach those things, which would start with a very thorough analysis between labs and, and that. And, you know, that's what you and I are doing day in and day out here at the Reardon Clinic now. And so, um, but hopefully this was a great primer for people uh, and, and gives them sort of that understanding of how to look at how the underlying issues tie in with, with what we're focusing on on the conventional side in terms of just the cancer itself. Right. And let them know that there's so much else that they can do, but they need a guide, right? Yeah, and and we are guides, but we're also we're also teachers, and we're also learning with them. So yeah. teaching them about their labs, I think that that's teaching them about labs, epigenetics, everything that we do. So yeah, yeah, fantastic. Well, hopefully everybody learned something today. Thanks for being with us, Dr. West, and uh, we'll do this again soon. Yes, we will. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Real Health Podcast. If you enjoy this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. You can also find all of the episodes and show notes over at realhealthpodcast.org. Also, be sure to visit reardonclinic.org where you will find hundreds of videos and articles to help you create your own version of real health.